Where do you go to get motivated? To get away from the hurricanes and the forest fires and the political drama, that place where when you leave, you find yourself thinking, it'll all be okay. Where do you go to restore your confidence about our future? I go to the grocery store. <laughs> not out for a jog, not to have a picnic, not to the mountains. Seeing natural beauty actually worries me more, makes me more nervous about the path we're heading down. Now, you might be thinking, grocery stores, they bring out our worst, not our best. And I don't necessarily disagree. Grocery stores can epitomize our American addiction to excess and to waste. Plastic packaging galore, aisles of the unneeded and the unnecessary, healthy food only the privileged can afford. Like when potato chips cost less than the potatoes they're made from. But when I need that motivation, I don't have to step more than 20 feet into the store. I observe customers in the checkout lines, and as they make their way through the queue, and the cashier finally asks that stereotypical grocery store question, paper or plastic, customers reply with enthusiasm and with pride, letting the cashier know that it doesn't matter, because they brought their own reusable bags. <laughs> it's amazing. Reusable grocery bags offer customers near zero personal advantages. They cost money. They are obnoxious in the trunks of our car, and they take up precious cart space in the store, yet we keep buying them. The only reason to own reusable bags is to be sustainable. They, better than any other example I can come up with, confirm my long-held belief that people genuinely want to be sustainable. In this case, they want to keep plastics out of our waterways, and they want to reduce their personal carbon and energy footprints. It's exciting. And yes, to me, it's motivating. Now, before I advance further into this talk, I want to make one point very clear. This is not, and I'll repeat because it's important, this is not another talk about climate change. Climate has changed. Step outside, see it for yourself. You don't need me to tell you for what I'm sure would be the 1,000th time what will happen to our planet as temperatures and as tides rise. You already know. That first ever intergovernmental panel on climate change report was released in 1990, when I was in kindergarten, by the way. Which means that for more than two and a half decades, we've been having the same debates with arguably no progress. If the likes of Elon Musk, Al Gore, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, and Leonardo DiCaprio can't convince you, <laughs> John Atkinson can't either, no matter how passionate his pleas may be. These debates of yes, no, if, then, cause, effect, real, fake, have gotten us nowhere. And yet influential speakers, top leaders in their fields, continue to give lectures and discussions about facts, thinking that all of a sudden scare tactics and sad polar bears are going to motivate us to make change. They didn't, they aren't, and they won't. We need a new approach which is why this talk marks the last time that I argue for climate change. Not because my position has wavered, it most certainly has not, but because I'm tired, and because I'm bored, and because I don't view this as a productive use of anyone's time. Again, we need a new approach, which is why today I'm talking about sustainability. Sustainability, much like the new me, doesn't care if you believe in climate change. A sustainable life might mean saving money. It might mean improving your personal health and wellness. It might mean improving your community or cleaning up your parks. And yes, there is a chance that if we all convert to a sustainable lifestyle, we can even prevent the imminent destruction of our planet. But I'm comfortable calling that a pleasant side effect. It doesn't need to be the primary motivation. It just needs to happen. Sustainability is a buzzword, which means we all know it, most of us use it, and few understand it. Let me give you an example. You might be surprised to hear that sustainable and green are not synonyms. Similarly, sustainable and cost-effective, not synonyms. A sustainable solution to a problem, any problem you can come up with, 
is one that optimally minimizes impact on environment, society, and economy. Now, I'm an engineer, so I need to sneak a little bit of math in all my talks, and I'll do it here by saying that sustainability is not a one-variable equation. It is a three-variable equation, and it requires equal consideration of each of the three components, environment, society, and economy. It disappoints me to hear large corporations define sustainable progress by return on investment. We won't do this, or we won't make that change unless the payback time is two months. Unsustainable. It goes against the very definition of the word. If we're truly living sustainably, we understand that there might be a cost associated with improving our environment or bettering our society and our communities. That cost might be financial or it might be personal. Think about those reusable bags. They improve the environment with financial cost to the consumer. In most cases, they are certainly not cost effective. The return on investment is horrendous, but they are sustainable. But here's the unfortunate reality about those grocery bags, and I apologize in advance here, I am just the messenger, <laughs> but they don't really matter. They don't, sorry. <laughs> Symbolically, I think they represent so much about the people we're willing to be, about the effort we're willing to put in. But contributing to real, meaningful, sustainable living, not so much. And so I'll reiterate here that I genuinely believe that people want to be sustainable, but add a caveat that says they have no idea how to do it. I think you think you know how, but do you? Do you really? Let's go back to the grocery store and follow those customers to their cars. You're likely to see them loading their reusable grocery bags into a massive pickup truck or an SUV. Look inside the bags. You'll see excessive amounts of plastic packaging and near unhealthy amounts of highly inefficient red meat. Follow them home, where you'll find near daily arrivals of online shopping shipments loaded with cardboard, plastic, and air. And those same customers that shop with reusable grocery bags and believe in climate change take 20-minute showers, and they drive to a post office that's three blocks away. It's a fascinating problem, and I believe that it hinges on education, which is why any time I have the opportunity to speak about sustainability, my goal is simple. Show the audience what a sustainable lifestyle looks like. Teach them what is required. Growing up, I, and hopefully many of you, were challenged to be sustainable. We didn't call it sustainability at the time. In my house, we called it something like saving money on the electricity bill. But the motivations were similar. My teaching and training, along with relentless exposure to mass and social media, has shown me that little, if anything, has changed. And we continue to associate sustainability with trivial tasks. Turn off the lights. Change your light bulbs. Unplug idle chargers. Stop the cold water when brushing your teeth. And yes, reuse grocery bags. We think that if we can check all these boxes, we're doing our part. We can officially call ourselves sustainable. The reality is, however, that the net impact of these tasks is small, dare I say negligible, compared to all the other places in our lives where we consume. You see, when we do these things, the only thing we're really trying to sustain is our lifestyle. We've convinced ourselves that these things matter and subsequently told ourselves that they're relevant. At best, these tasks should be considered status quo, an absolute bare minimum needed to even exist. And as we all know, as we all live every day and read in the news, status quo is unsustainable. There's a wonderful book. It's called Sustainability Without the Hot Air. It's freely available online by David Mackay, and I encourage everybody to give it a read. The data behind me was modified from that textbook, and it shows where an average American consumes. You'll note all the way down at the end, mere blips on the radar, we have lighting and gadgets. 
low-hanging fruit that I'm not suggesting you ignore, but that shouldn't satisfy our desires to be better. Cars, planes, heating, stuff, including all those places we waste on a day-by-day basis, and even the food we eat, these are the bars that are dominating our consumption. Yet they're the things we're not trying to touch, not trying to change. If all you do in your life is replace bulbs and bags, you might be a percent or two better than someone that does nothing. A percent or two better than somebody that doesn't even believe in climate change. I've thought long and hard about why we're not tackling these big bars. And my solution is disappointing. It's because it's hard. And because we're lazy. And because we're comfortable, we like our lives the way they are. We don't want to change things. An interesting thing happened when I started teaching my sustainability course. Early in the semester, I asked students to rate their personal level of sustainability. And now, the sustainability course has primarily junior and senior level environmental engineers, students that are committing themselves to a lifetime improving the planet. And so I wasn't surprised to find that they rated themselves pretty high. They think they're doing a pretty good job. So I said, why? I followed up. I said, what are you doing to be this role model, this example for your peers? This is when it got a bit more disappointing, with the most common response being bulbs and bags. We're noticing a trend. And so I created a project that's called the 447 Challenge. It's named after my sustainability course number at the University at Buffalo. The 447 Challenge asks students to document their instructor-curated sustainability efforts. The project uses Twitter so that the results aren't only accessible to myself and my students, but also to the campus, the community, local businesses, and even global sustainability audiences. With this project, students learn sustainability by living sustainably, and then they tell the world about it. In two years, we've generated over 650 tweets which I estimate to reach well over 50,000 people. The project brings Twitter into, but also out of the classroom, fostering camaraderie among the students. They find themselves laughing about sustainability, talking about it on the weekends, going to parties and telling their friends, telling their families. Each week I give them a new challenge, a challenge that has actual impact. I ask them to change one thing in their lives and combined over the course of a semester, 10 weekly challenges show the students what it means to call yourself sustainable. A missionless, for example, ask them to go a week without driving their cars. Short showers, ask them to cut shower times down to four minutes or less. Spring cleaning, ask them to donate unused clothing and non-perishable food items to a local food pantry. No meat week, ask the I think you can figure out no meat week on your own. (laughs) Some of the challenges are difficult, others are easy, but that is the point. When I started the project, it was just supposed to be simple and fun, a new way to teach sustainability to students. But it has catalyzed a social movement in my classes, using Twitter to push this positive message of sustainability to global audiences. We live in an interesting time a time when a new hurricane seems to ravage our coasts each week and forest fires continue to rage in the West. A time when it was nearly 90 degrees in Buffalo in October. A time when inequality worsens each week. And yes, a time when our federal government has decided to withdraw from the globally essential Paris Climate Agreement while simultaneously axing the clean power plan. I say with utter disappointment, but recent acceptance, that top-down approaches to improving our climate situation in the United States have officially failed. If you're one of the people that believe in climate change, but also believe that it's someone else's problem, you are out of luck. No one is going to solve this for you. So rise up. Take responsibility for your actions. Mobilize your people. Now, more than ever, change will only proceed through bottom-up, individual-level lifestyle modifications. And so I challenge everyone listening, 
to change something in your life. Do something hard. Be better than reusable grocery bags. If you can afford it, buy an electric vehicle. Or better still, walk, ride a bike, use public transportation. Fly less, volunteer more, eat less red meat, take shorter showers, lower your thermostat, try them all. See what sticks. But remember that sustainability requires sacrifice and isn't always easy. But that doesn't mean that the pros can't outweigh the cons. So here's my day now. I wake up early. I'm one of those obnoxious morning people that's productive before 7. But I wake up really early, take a short shower, and give my dog a long walk before heading to work. My commute times tripled when I started taking public transportation. But that round trip commute now includes about two and a half miles of daily exercise. I can squeeze in a 20 minute nap or two on the train. And most importantly, you are looking at a level 36 Pokemon Go trainer. <laughs> right, it's not so bad. Eating less meat forced me to learn how to cook. And now in the evenings, my wife and I enjoy trying out new recipes often with veggies that we purchased at the farmer's market and carried home in our reusable bags, <laughs> the scraps of which we compost in our backyard. I volunteer serving meals to less privileged neighbors at a food pantry down the street from my house. I donate to community supporting microgrants. And just this week, I joined the board of directors for my local neighborhood association. Motivate yourself in whatever way works for you. Improve the climate if you think it needs improving. But if you don't, do it to save money. Do it to improve your family's health. Do it to better your community. Do it to put a smile on someone else's face. Each of these reasons to live sustainably has merit. And as far as I'm concerned, none is better than the next. But we all need to be challenging ourselves to put sustainability forward.